um, faces and names that I know. Let me start sharing my screen here. Make sure that everything is OK on my end. All right, and I have the chat in front of me. So um, if there are any questions or any of uh, anything that comes up, I'll be asking a couple of things and some prompts during this webinar. So please feel free to, to use the chat um, feature. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, I want to I want to note before I start uh, actually goes back to what Julia was saying about uh, the captioning in uh, in teams. Uh, a nice tip that I I actually got from Hannah McGregor, for some of you who know who's at SFU, um, is um, actually using the captions uh, as a way to um, monitor my speak my speech as I'm teaching online. So when I get really excited about something, as I do about accessible as <laughs> assessments, uh, I have a tendency to speak a, a lot quicker than than normal if I was talking about something that I'm not as interested in. And so the captions are a really great way of, of me actually making sure that um, I don't get too excited so that the captions can't keep up with me. Uh, so that's that's my my tip to to start this um, webinar uh, meeting on accessible assessment and universal design for learning. Um, Julia gave a, a wonderful land acknowledgement and flagged some of the events that are happening here at Brock at the end of the week. Um, I uh, want to uh, take this opportunity to flag the traditional lands where I grew up, which were the traditional lands of the Abitsubi Winnie Aki, um, which are lands that are covered by the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. And before coming to Brock, um, as Julia said, uh, about a month and a week ago, um, I lived for 30 years uh, on the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and so both of those places, and now this third place, uh, have become uh, what has, where I have grown, where I have learned, where I've been in community with others. And so I'm very happy to be with you here. Uh, today and uh, I acknowledge all of the lands where I've learned. So before um, we start, I know that um, we were going to share the the slides and I'm not sure if uh, if we can pop those in the chat if in case you wanted to to have them to follow along um, as as I'm going along. Um, I want to uh, give some space for some starting thoughts because I know that some of you may be approaching this particular concept of accessible uh, assessments in different ways. So I want you to take a few moments to jot down some words or phrases that come to mind when you think about accessible assessment. OK, so you, you can keep those uh, to yourself um, or in a few in a few minutes, I, I might get you to sh share in the chat. So when you think about accessible assessment, what comes to mind? Thank you, Julia, for sharing the slides. OK, so um, if some of you feel comfortable sharing in the chat some of the words or phrases that came to mind, please feel free to do so now. Um, if you want to keep that to yourself because that that is more comfortable for you, then of course, uh, please feel free to do that as well. But um, if anyone wants to share some of the words or ideas when you think about accessible assessments, what comes to mind? Okay, so students having different ways of demonstrating what they know. Yeah. That's good. That's a good one. We're going to talk about that with UDL. Any others? Multimodality, equity, uh, unique, individualized. Those are great words. Yes. More than one entry point for the students. Absolutely. Fair, fairness. Yeah, absolutely. Great, these are great words. Flexibility. Yeah, 
So we're going to touch on a lot of these things today, actually. Um, uh, clarity in terms of the systems of evaluations, clarity and assessments. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, uh, assumptions, multimodality or assumptions that the submission format is uh, compatible with different abilities. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And again, um, I think these original, you know, those, these beginning thoughts are going to be useful for, for us as we go through this um, and think about some of the things that may kind of agree with what, what you're saying and maybe other things that you may not have thought of. Um, continuous improvements. Yeah. So um, before I start uh, into the um, into the sort of outline and objectives of this of this webinar, uh, I want to frame some important topics and, and concepts, right? So um, we want to make sure that when we're thinking about uh, accessible assessments, that we are approaching this by acknowledging the fact that everyone has different lived experience. And so we talk a lot about positionality in higher education, and I think positionality is something that's really important to think about in terms of the positionality of your students, okay? And so that can mean a lot of different things. That could mean, uh, you know, having conversations uh, about uh, disability, accessibility, race, class, gender, uh, sexual orientation, all of those things. Um, positionality becomes an important piece of uh, how we think about assessments. Um, and when we see gaps in assessments, that's uh, oftentimes uh, because certain positionalities have not uh, been taken into account. Um, also, this idea of trust right so how we want to build trust we want to build trust in our educational spaces and that trust is built in community but also acknowledging that community is not a given right so just putting a bunch of learners and yourself in a space does not a community make um, community is something that is built um, and is not something that is given and so we talk a lot about a community of learners well that community of learners is built just like you know the bra community is built and and so on so we want to think about trust in relation to community as uh, not necessarily a given, but something that is built through assessment strategies, through the pedagogy that you have in your classrooms. Um, also acknowledging uh, before I start that inclusion and equity work is continuous work and not a checklist work. Um, so it's important for us to think about um, how we continue building on that inclusion, how we continue building on that equity, the flexibility, the fairness that that those of you are noting in the in the chat, and uh, not uh, um, approach these things as a checklist to check off, and also this idea of interdependence. And interdependence is important in disability justice. For those of you who may um, be aware of disability justice principles, um, and what interdependence helps support is that we help. It's, it's to think about how we help meet our needs when we support others' needs, right? So how everyone is sort of interconnected. And so again, that goes back to this idea of building community. If we want to build a real community of trust, we want to acknowledge that all of our needs um, are, are interconnected, okay? So with all of those sort of framed uh, ideas in mind, uh, some of the objectives for today, our time together, is to outline the three universal design for learning principles, which some of you probably know a lot about, um, and how they connect to inclusive design, uh, then explain some of the necessary considerations for accessible assessment design, some things that you may want to think about, and uh, you know, give you some space to analyze uh, your assessment needs that are particular um, and strategies that are particular to the context of your course and in the context of generative AI, because of course we cannot have a conversation about assessment right now uh, in September of 2023 um, without having a conversation about generative AI and how that uh, plays uh, in relation to accessibility as well. So those are the objectives. This is the outline of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start a little bit with what is universal design for learning, talk about the principles and inclusive design, and then go into accessible assessment uh, design and how we can support accessible assessment design, um, but also some common threats that we see to um, accessible assessment design before ending with um, some opportunities to think about equity assessment and and, uh, generative AI. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, because I know that 
um, for me, when I'm ever in a webinar or something, the outline slide always goes too quickly and I'm trying to write an outline from my notes so that I can follow along. So I'm just going to give you a moment <laughs> to write the outline if you are one of those people. Um, and, and then I'll start and I'll also say that uh, I do have the chat in front of me. So if at any time you have any questions um, or anything that you'd like to share, please uh, feel free to share it in the chat. I know that I'll be monitoring it and I also know that Matt is uh, monitoring it as well. OK, so what is universal design for learning? So I let's see if this works. Fantastic. Um, I've popped into the chat the link um, to the cast UDL guidelines. Some of you may already have this bookmarked on your uh, on your browsers. If you don't, uh, now you have it. Um, so universal design for learning or UDL uh, is a framework for teaching and learning. And one of the things that I'd like to emphasize is that what, what Universal Design for Learning does is that it helps support some aspects of inclusive pedagogy. Um, what you often hear uh, about Universal Design is um, oftentimes like, well, if I do UDL, then I'm doing inclusive pedagogy. And yes, uh, in, in some ways, absolutely. If you're thinking about Universal Design principles, then you have that inclusive framework uh, to your pedagogy, to your assessments. But it is not the only thing. Um, and so there's a tendency sometimes of, of seeing UDL as the all or uh, of seeing UDL as the checklist that I was referring to previously uh, of the thing that uh, one needs to do uh, in order to kind of just, you know, have done all of the accessible and inclusive things that one needs to do. Um, I know that CAST is presently, um, uh, which as it says here on the slide, Center for Applied uh, Special Technology, um, is in the process of mo modifying some of these guidelines and principles to take into account some of the gaps that folk have mentioned to them in the past. And one of the biggest, biggest gaps was around, um, you know, equity, uh, around race, um, in particular, and class and gender. So when you look at the Universal Design for Learning guidelines, there's nothing in those guidelines that specifically talks about race, that specifically talks about class or religion or gender or any of those kinds of things. And so what um, they're trying to do is to put more of an equity lens into these guidelines to make them a little bit more holistic and more inclusive. But until that happens, um, we do still need to acknowledge that these Universal Design for learning uh, guidelines is a framework for teaching and, and learning to be more inclusive, but it is not the the only one or the only thing um, that one should think about. And um, in particular today, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that you could think about um, how universal design for learning can help start um, your thought process when you're doing assessment design. And then what are some other steps that we can do to go over and beyond that as well? OK, again, um, all of this is going to be contextual. I acknowledge that, you know, there are 41, well, 40 other people in this room beside me. Um, some of you um, teach very different kinds of courses and different disciplines with different uh, amounts of students, different types of assessments that are sort of assessments that you do in your um, in your discipline. And so um, please, uh, you know, think about the contextual aspect of it. And if there are some contextual things that do come up in our conversation that you want to discuss more, I know that we'll have time at the end to talk about that. All right, so one of the first uh, main principles of uh, universal design for learning, if you want, you see on the CAS guidelines, is that uh, this belief that uh, multiple means of engagement is something that we should have in our uh, in our classes, right? So there are some guidelines there based on multiple means of engagement and um, multiple means of engagement is a really interesting um, thing when it comes to assessment and it's a really interesting thing when it comes to pedagogy because there's this belief that engagement looks like a certain thing right so when we talk about engagement there's this sort of stereotype of engagement right um so maybe we take a moment here and and uh and type in the chat when we think about engagement or we see the word engagement what do we think of what comes to mind you can type it in the chat participation yes a big one. What else? 
interactivity. Answering questions. Um, observable behavior. Okay, so this idea that engagement is observable. Um, attention and curiosity, that's really great. Um, you Learning the content in a context, absolutely. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we have like a couple of things here in, in the chat, right? So um, this idea that, you know, answering questions or this idea of like participation, but also this idea of, of observable, right? Like that somehow if we look at a person, we can tell that somehow that they're engaged, right? And and often these, these ideas about uh, engagement are really built into um, more ableist frameworks around pedagogy, right? And so this idea that we can um, see everything that's going on. And so uh, what I want to emphasize here on this slide is that engagement is contextual. And so how a student engages in your course may be completely different than a way that another student engages in another course. And how you as a person, you as an instructor, as a professor, as a staff member, as a teaching assistant, uh, engage um, may look different from day to day as well because we're not robots. Um, and so uh, and so we want to we want to make sure that engagement is contextual and we remember that engagement is contextual, right? And so that our day to day um, uh, way of, of engaging and sometimes we have like a high engagement day where we're just like we're answering all the emails and we're doing all the things and we're we're listening to all, to all the podcasts. And then we have like a day where our engagement is not so much because, you know, it was a long weekend or, you know, you had something come up with your family or any of those kinds of things. So remember that engagement engagement is contextual just as much for you as the person who's teaching the course um, as it is uh, for the students. And so some students will have, you know, sort of high engagement days and some will have um, have lower engagement days. And if you have different ways of engaging in your course, right? So whether it's raising the hand uh, and answering a question or whether it's using a bright space, right? Like online or in person, um, then you can use those learning management system tools to get them to engage as well, right? So we have a lot of tools at our disposal um, to really build that engagement, like the chat, for example, right? Like the chat is a perfect example of the kind of engagement we're having. And just because you're not typing in the chat, right now doesn't mean that you're not engaged. I, I see you even if I don't see you, right? Um, thinking about signs of engagement from someone who is more shy or minoritized, where, exactly, where English is not a primary language, that engagement piece can look very different, right? And so they will probably be engaging, but maybe they're choosing to engage in a way that feels more comfortable to them, and that is okay, right? Fantastic. So um, in the Universal Design for Learning guidelines, you'll see that some engagement guidelines that focus around like how do I generate interest, right? How do I make uh, the learners sort of interested in, in the topic? And I know that some of you use, you know, real life and real world examples to kind of generate that interest because they want to see that authenticity. They want to see how that connects. Um, some of the engagement guidelines also uh, deal with aspects of self-regulation. So how do we get the learners to uh, get used to sort of the flow of our course, right? Um, what is they're expected to do in each lecture, what they're expected to do in each lab or practical. Um, and so getting used to like, okay, on Mondays they do this thing, on Tuesdays in this class they do that thing and so on. Um, and then like to maintain that sort of effort and persistence throughout the semester. And I know that we're already in week four and we're seeing already that sort of like ebbs and flows of, of um, you know, students and staff and faculty um, how you know we're, we're going into October and the first assignments are coming due some of the quizzes are coming due and so we're now is a time where um, giving some supports in terms of the effort um, and persistence that we want uh, is there and a lot of this goes back to what some folk were saying in the chat previously which is giving um, clarity of instructions in terms of what you what you're expected um, a lot of that work is done in rubric which we can talk about. Uh, a lot of that work is done in in the um, actual instructions for your activities and, and so on, right? And also being aware of that effort and persistence and how that kind of again ebbs and flows as the semester goes on, right? So we're gonna we're going into a little bit of a lull until maybe the you know Thanksgiving and then there'll be a little bit of a an uptick and then again 
Um, if one uh, learning outcome is to increase their skills for public speech and facilitation skills, how do we accommodate the students' different learning while still achieving? This is a fantastic question, and I'm going to put a pin in that because I think this is something that we can certainly come back to. Um, and uh, Matt and Julia, if I don't remember to answer this question, please remind me to answer that question. Oh, thank you. Pinning a message. Um, so the um, the second uh, principle of the guidelines is providing multiple means of representation. Um, and so we talked a little bit about multimodality. So we, we, we know different aspects of multimodality in our courses, different aspects of multimodality in our assessments, right? So we're used to, you know, textual assessments. Um, depending on the courses that you teach, you may have images as part of your assessments. Uh, depending on the courses that you teach, you may have audio or video as part of your assessments. Um, something that I'm pushing because we have a, a really great makerspace here at Brock is thinking about tangibles for example, right, and how you can use uh, tangibles as a, another form of multimodality. I know a lot of uh, math uh, professors use tangibles uh, or science, uh, science professors use tangibles, and so having something to actually manipulate um, can be part of that uh, assessment strategy too. And so multimodality comes with a lot of um, Multiplicity comes with a lot of accessibility uh, considerations as well, right? So we talk about making sure we have captions on audio, making sure that a podcast has a transcript if you're going to assign it, or if you assign a podcast, um, asking the students to also produce a, a transcript, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and so that choice model uh, that that is provided in that multiple means of representation um, is an important choice model in that assessment strategy. So when you're designing your course and you're thinking about the learning outcomes, so like the, the pinned question uh, we're saying, when you're thinking about how you can achieve those uh, those learning outcomes, uh, in different ways, there are certainly different ways in a multimodal way that you can achieve a learning outcome, especially if you're asking a student to analyze a particular thing, right? So that analysis can be done in an essay, that analysis can be done um, in, you know, images that can, that analysis can be done in a video and so on. Um, and so think about the different multimodalities that could be done in relation to your learning outcomes. When we're thinking about representation and we're thinking about the guidelines under UDL uh, for that, um, we talk about like perceiving information, right? So again, this is where that multimodality comes into play. The different languages and symbols that we use. Um, academics know that we love our jargon. Right, we love our lingo. We have like things, you know. Um, higher education spaces are full of acronyms, um, and so one of the one of the biggest challenges, I think, and I know that there's a couple of people on the call where, like, I know that I'm new, but I know that there's a couple of people that are also relatively new to to Brock, um, where there's like language and symbols that are used, and it's just like, oh, write down the acronym, and just like I gotta Google that later because I have no idea what what office that is and so on. And so the same thing with the students, right? So especially if they're first generation students, I'm a first generation student. And so I always think about um, the first generation students is uh, when I went to university and I was navigating, you know, the big space that was U of T when I was an undergrad, um, I didn't necessarily have uh, family members where I would be like, you know, what do I put on this registrar's office form, right? Like these were all things that I had to figure out on my own. And so uh, when we're thinking about different ways of representing that information, language and symbols, it's really important to spell out those acronyms, really important to make it explicit in terms of what you're trying to get uh, the folk uh, to, to learn, right? And this will really help, you know, the third point, which is the comprehension, right? It's really hard for a learner to comprehend what's asked of them um, uh, in particular, if it's just given as a series of like symbols and acronyms and not uh, anything else. Um, a great point in the chat about uh, accreditation bodies and making sure that those accreditation bodies are taken into account. And absolutely. So if you're like in nursing or or so on, like those, uh, you know, any kind of medicine, um, those kinds of uh, accreditation bodies will, will also have their learning outcomes. And often those learning outcomes will 
will um, will often dictate what the assessment looks like and the deliverable of the assessment, right? Whether it looks like this or whether it looks like a presentation, whether it looks like, you know, and so on. And so um, we want to also acknowledge that, that, that there are always uh, those, those um, programs and those limits that we need to think about as well to make sure that we're meeting and managing our accreditation needs uh, in programs. And then finally, the last principle, which is uh, multiple means of action and expression. And so again, this is really sort of tied into the learning outcomes of your course and so or the, the learning outcomes of the accreditation body and thinking about how those learning outcomes can be met in different ways, right? Um, and so this might be actually a good time to go back to that pinned um, that pinned question and thinking about like so say your learning outcome is about a public speech and facilitation and how we're going to accommodate this in different ways you may have students that even if public speech is a learning outcome of your course that um you know they have anxiety they have different things that um will make that um a little bit more uh different for them and so we want to think about the learning outcomes of the course so if the learning outcome of the course is public speech well what does public speech look like is public speech necessarily uh the learner standing in front of a hundred people Right. Um, or is public speech like if I record this, is this is this not public speech? Right. Like is I mean, is it public? Um, so like, you know, this is also, you know, public speech. Right. And so the way that we speak in different ways and the way that we attain those learning outcomes can be different. Right. So if I'm recording this and it's for a class on public speak, I'm speaking publicly right now, right? And so am I not, you know, attaining those learning outcomes? If there's some granularity to that learning outcome, then we can, of course, have a conversation, which is why this is why my position exists, right? Is to think about um, the learning outcomes of your course, to think about the granularity of that, to think about if there's different ways that the students can meet those same learning outcomes um, if you've received a, a, a note and oasis about accommodations for your course and so on. And so working directly with the instructor working directly with the professor the you know the teaching assistant to help support um, what that assessment looks like and attaining those learning outcomes so those multiple means of action and expression really come down to the learning outcomes of the course and i'm going to talk a little bit more um, about the constructs of your course and making sure that we're framing it in terms of relevant constructs and not irre irrelevant constructs. Um, but that's on a that's on a separate slide. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, thinking about like how we ask the students to show their learning, right? Um, uh, I appreciate the creativity that we can get unleashed exactly when we have these conversations with the students, right? Um, students are you know, they know their limits, they know, you know, what they need. They're also very creative in terms of knowing what will allow them to meet particular learning outcomes as well. And so, you know, again, we can have those conversations. So how do we, like the big question is, how do students show their learning and do they need to show their learning in one particular way or are there different ways that they can um, show their learning? And so under those principles of, uh, you know, the guidelines of action and expression, we think about expressing and communicating, right? And so again, we have multiple ways of, of expressing ourselves, of communicating. So whether that's a presentation in class, whether that's a recorded uh, presentation with uh, PowerPoints, uh, with a voiceover, whether it's, you know, recording on Teams and sharing that as a video. Um, and then we go back again to this sort of executive functioning um, where we're helping to support the learners um, to really like support what they need to do to get a thing done. And one of the things that I, uh, one of the people that I really appreciate about this is Karen Costa. I'm just going to type this in the chat and I'll find the link later, uh, who um, differentiates between this, let me just type this here, who differentiates between uh, this um, the due date, which is what we emphasize in our courses, right? So when is a thing due versus the due date, as in like letting the students know the, the aspects or the different aspects of the things that 
um, they need to do to meet those learning outcomes to meet that assessment, right? And so we often, um, when we do our assessment design and write our instructions, we focus on the due date, D-U-E, as in like this is due at this time, when a lot of the things that we can do in class or in those instructions is thinking about the due date. Like, so what are the different ways? Can we break this up, right? Um, and so on. And so there's a follow-up question, avoid making the students stand out. Um, if you have those choice models in your access in uh, and accessibility in mind in your assignments and giving them choice in terms of how they present, then nobody will necessarily like stand out or feel different because people will self select in the way that will feel comfortable to them. So do they want to do a recording? Do they want to present in front of people? Because dealing with technology and doing a, a recording just seems like a lot, um, you know, those those kinds of things. Right. So. Um, and thank you for that question. It's a great question. Uh, so going back to this action and expression, really like those executive functionings, thinking about like what can we scaffold, how can we scaffold, and how can we support that scaffolding in our classes, right? Um, so with that, before I go on to other things, I just want to stop here. There, I know that there's been some comments and ideas and things that have been coming in. Are there any comments so far? Tone and pace, okay. Do you need me to slow down? Do you need me to? Okay, so we're getting some yeses and noes. Okay, good. All right, fantastic. Um, for those of you, I'm getting some thumbs up. You see, look, engagement. Some folk have their cameras on, and I'm getting noddings. Some people are using emojis and emoticons. They are all engaging in different ways, and so I'm, you know, I can appreciate that, and I will respond to that in different ways. So, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, accessible assessment design, of course, starts with accessible student learning outcomes that take into account students' lived experience, but also, as we talked about, our own lived experience as instructors and staff professors. Um, and so oftentimes uh, we may have learning outcomes that in and of itself assume a kind of sensory, assume a kind of way, one way of doing a thing, right, that are not necessarily aligned to the kinds of UDL principles that we've talked about, right? Um, and so that sensory piece, which is, seems to be the, the big bigger piece that you see in, in learning outcomes, is an important one. So we want to really objectively look at our learning outcomes and say, are these accessible learning outcomes to start, right? Like, are we assuming a particular kind of student in this learning outcome? Um, what if I do not have that particular kind of student in my class, right? Um, and so, again, um, this is why I am here. So if you need uh, support to look at your learning outcomes uh, and, and, uh, and to think about them um, in a different perspective, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. And so these, once you look at your learning outcomes and you feel you know, comfortable with them, that they're not like assuming a particular learner or particular type of learner, <clears throat> then we can think about choice models. Two seconds. Thank you. Then we can think about choice models, right? And this is where universal design for learning can really help with that. Um, <clears throat> so we can have multiple means of showing their knowledge, right? So um, we talked about multimodality. We talked, you know, presentation as a perfect example of that. So whether they're presenting in front of a class, whether they're recording, whether they're doing a webinar, you know, and in some ways even podcasting is, you know, public dissemination of knowledge, right? And so that may also um, count uh, as that as well. So accessible assessment design thinks of UDL, thinks of the multiple means of engagement, thinks of the multiple uh, action and expression and so on and builds on that. But you need to you need to think about uh, starting from like learning outcomes that are in and of itself accessible. Now, once you have that, then we get into the fun equity and justice stuff that um, that uh, you know makes me excited anyway. So in the chat, I just want to stop here because you know you've heard my voice for a while. Uh, can you give me one example of equity and justice work that's being done in your discipline? And also, as a bonus, if you have a link to a cool thing that's happening in your discipline about equity and justice that you want to share. Let's let's share some cool things. So I know we all come from different places. What are some really cool um, equity and justice work 
that's being done in your disciplines. It could be anything. I hope there's something that makes you excited. Prison math. Ah, yeah, I've heard of that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I teach material cultures and museum studies, and I love this resource both for its construction as an exhibit and as a way of thinking. Thank you so much for sharing. So we have some cool math things going on. We have some cool material culture things going on. Maybe related. Okay, let's see, let me scroll back up here. Um, common language assessment in North America assessment is called learning goals um, or terms of learning. In Europe, it's called intended learning outcomes. Yeah. Educators in psychology textbooks, making them more inclusive and giving a Creative Commons license. Yes, absolutely. It's really great. So there are some cool things that are happening in your disciplines, right? Yes, the Black Student Success Center at Brock, fantastic. It's really great as well. So there, you know, these equity and justice pieces that we that we have and that we care about, right? Supporting first generation students in whatever discipline you're in, absolutely. Um, so we've talked about making sure that your learning outcomes are accessible, and if not, we can have a conversation about that. We talked about using the universal design guidelines to help support when you're designing your assessment. But we also see here in the chat that there are some really cool equity and justice things that we care about, that we're passionate about, that are happening in our discipline. And so accessible assessment design also brings in these ideas of equity and justice into our assessments. Um, you know, cultural competencies in nursing, another great example that's in the chat right now. Um, so there are some equity and justice principles that we want to think about in our assessment design. And I have a couple of slides where I'm going to elaborate on what that can look like, um, especially through a disability justice lens and um, you know what that could look like in a different context of your of your course. Thank you for sharing these great things. You see that this is this is also the possibility of a of a webinar like this, right? It's like sharing resources, um, sparking ideas in terms of things that you may want to bring into some of the assignments that you're doing in your classes, things that you've done for many semesters that you want to change up or bring in different resources. Um, yes, compassionate pedagogy and library instruction. Yeah, fantastic. See, I love this. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. This is such a great list. I feel like we need to create a Padlet or something. Um, or another cool tool. Um, and so one of the reasons why I mentioned this, shameless plug, um, is because uh, a book that you may be interested in is a, a book by Sasha Constanza Chalk called Design Justice. And I, I somebody, uh, Julia, probably can put a, a link to, to this in the chat or whatever. But we're doing an asynchronous uh, reading uh, group um, where we're reading a chapter of this book on design justice. Um, and so if this is something, oh, there, Rajiv's got the actual book. Yes, it's in my my office at home as well. Um, so if you have, uh, if you're interested in design justice or want to think about more about how I design, you know, you want to design things with a justice lens, um, Alyssa, and I, Alyssa and I are, are going to be uh, facilitating this. And so please uh, join us in thinking about uh, design justice and pedagogy and uh, just basically just to spend more time with me and Alisa, uh, because, you know, why wouldn't you not want to spend more time with us? Um, and <laughs> and so um, now I want to get to the to the crux. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, you're welcome. I'm, and we're really looking forward to having conversations about that particular chapter because that chapter talks about design justice principles. That chapter talks about um, using community to help inform the kinds of assessments and the kinds of activities that one does. And I think there's a lot to be said about uh, community engagement and thinking about community. I know that Brock is a big experiential learning school, um, and I think that there are real some real opportunities uh, to to talk about those interactions and intersections in relation to creating more, you know, justice minded uh, assessment strategies. So, um, so how do we support accessible assessment design? So this slide has like a whole bunch of different things. I'm going to go through each. If there's anything that you'd like me to elaborate more on, please feel free. So one of the first things um, that uh, you may want to think about in your accessible assessment is having inclusive exemplars or case studies, right? So we tend to, like if we're using a case, for example, we tend to have like, you know, some sort of white heteronormative, like my favorite example um, is uh, that I use is usually like a math example, which is um, Johnny and Susan are wanting to get landscaping done of, at their house. Um, and so how do you calculate the surface area of the landscaping? And it's so then you've already lost half of your students because one, um, some folk in, in some of the learners will never own a house. Um, some of the learners uh, never don't know what landscaping is because they live in apartment buildings and they've lived in apartment buildings their whole life, right? And so, but we do this, right? Like we we have this tendency of, of having these exemplars or these case studies that are very like assuming a, a particular class, assuming a particular positionality, assuming a, a particular, you know, um, any race, any any of those kinds of things. And so we want to think about how our exemplars and our case studies can be more representative of our learners, right? And can be more representative of their lived experience and can be more representative of you as, as the instructor and, and your lived experience as well, right? So um, look at some of the examples that you have in the instructions or some of the cases that, uh, or the scenarios that you're asking your learners to respond to and, and, and kind of ask yourself, well, can I make these more inclusive, right? Um, do you have any mention of an actual disability in some of these cases? Chances are you, you probably don't, right? Um, and so, you know, is there a way of, you know, including disabled folk into your cases, right? And making people, you know, realize that disabled people exist and are all around them on a regular basis every day. Um, and so there's, there's that part. Um, the other part to accessible assessment design is thinking about the technology and the tools that we're asking the students to use in relation to the assessment, right? So we're going back to that conversation that someone uh, that someone had in the chat about, like, we want to make sure that we uh, meet our accreditation standards if there's something that, you know, is part of that accreditation standard. So maybe your accreditation standard says that um, for your program, you need to use this technology, right? This tool. OK, so if that's the case, then fine. But for the most part, um, we're teaching or writing um, and, and acting and doing in courses where we have our own ways of kind of deciding what tools and tech are going to be used in the classroom. And so if you're asking the students to use a particular kind of tool, a particular kind of technology, let's let's think about the accessibility of that right let's that and i'm going to talk about this a little bit in relation to generative ai but um think about the accessibility of the tool right like is it you know is it easy to navigate what are like some of the parameters who can use this you know things like color contrast you know all of those kinds of things so that's that's one thing that we wanted to talk about and um there's lots of shameless plug for CPI. There's lots of great people that would love to have a conversation about that too here. Um, and so um, third thing for accessible assessment design, thinking about how that assessment is scaffolded, right? So we're going back to this idea of due date and due date. Um, you know, what are you asking the learners to do? Do they have to do an outline first? Do they have to do an annotated bibliography? Um, do they have to create uh, a learning profile? Do they have to do, it, depending on what your assi uh, scaffolded ass assignment is, there might be different parts to it, right? And so how do those parts build on each other, right? And how do those parts come as a whole? 
right? And so that scaffolded design will help with the executive function piece. That scaffolded design will help uh, identify any of the gaps that the learners may have. And so things that they need to ask you, um, other resources that you may need to share in your bright space or in class or so on. And so thinking about how um, you can probably scaffold that assessment a little bit more um, to help the learners kind of meet their goals and your goals. And ultimately, the thing that you'll um, ultimately the thing that you'll get as a final product will probably be better if it's gone through that scaffolded um, process because you've had opportunity to give feedback. They might have had opportunity to get feedback from their peers, you know, a whole bunch of different things like that. Authentic connections. Um, when I'm teaching, I know that um, I teach professional communications. Uh, one of the things that I tell the students uh, all the time is that I promise that the things that we do in this class will be useful to you in the world of work because I'm teaching business students, so they they really care about the world of work. Um, and so um, having authentic connections um, in uh, in your assessment is important, right? They want to see like, why am I learning this? Why do I, why do I have to do this particular thing? How is this going to connect to maybe some other courses that I have to take next semester or the kinds of things that um, we want to, uh, we want to do um, in the chat and create a fr friendly template to make, you know, things more appealing and motivating. Absolutely. Right. And, and having something that's very friendly and easy to navigate will also help support your neurodivergent learners in terms of finding the uh, information that they need to find. Right. So like if you have titles and headers that say like, you know, learning outcomes, instructions, rubric, so that they know what each of these parts are to that um, it'll make it a lot easier for them to find uh, the information that we need. So thank you so much for that. That's an excellent point. Um, so those authentic connections can look differently, again, depending on the course that you're teaching, right? So um, finding ways, again, that community piece, right? Like finding ways to make um, the learners see how this fits into their larger community, how this fits into their larger discipline. So say they're and you're like, you know, going to, they're sociologists and they want to be social workers or whatever. How does that, how does that help support um, their work in the future and their learning? Um, I know we have a very fantastic uh, trauma-informed pedagogy group um, here uh, at Brock um, and accessible assessment design is also trauma-aware. And so what do we mean by that? And I'm sure you've probably heard of this a lot, but a lot of the things, and I've uh, given a link there to the Missouri model, which I like because it, it kind of makes it a lot simpler to, to think about. Um, a lot of the things in trauma-aware pedagogical practices are things that kind of overlap with universal design. In fact, that's the kind of work that I do. I do trauma-aware universal design, um, and I have a group of folk that I, I talk to on a regular basis internationally about this. Um, trauma-aware means having choice models, which is what is very important to universal design for learning. Uh, trauma aware is about building an empowerment um, opportunities in those assessment strategies. So get, allowing your, your students, your learners to have more autonomous decision making on what they want to do, the choices that they want to do. Um, trauma awareness is also community building, right? So we go back to what I talked about at the beginning, um, which is how do we build the community and not just assume that just you know, just because 40 of these students are in the same room that this is automatically a community, right? A trauma aware approach will, you know, assume that everybody's coming in with different learned uh, lived experiences and we want to build that community and uh, and appreciate that and allow students to bring that into their assignments, into their activities, into their assessments. Um, and it's also a space that's really intersectionally aware, right? And so understanding that, you know, not everyone fits in a nice little box. Um, I read loves boxes. Um, and we know this. Um, and so we want to make sure that like, you know, that we're aware that not everyone fits into a nice little box uh, every day all the time. And uh, that needs to be part of that uh, assessment strategy as well. 
And so this comes to a piece that we've reiterated many times uh, over the time that we've been together so far, which is needing clear instructions, having clear rubrics, and having those documents that are really accessible, right? And so uh, following accessibility principles in the actual creation of the documents, following accessibility principles in the resources that you provide the, the students that they will use for their assessments. So like if they have images, for example, making sure that those images have all text, if it's a graph or a chart, having a description for that graph or a chart and so on. Um, and so uh, I know that uh, maybe Julia wants to pop this in the chat. CPI has a really great, uh, or Matt can pop this in the chat. CPI has a really great, nice page about um, how to create accessible resources. And so that if you don't, if you haven't seen that page, you may want to go to that page and, uh, and look at that as well. Um, and so in some ways though, uh, this brings us to the kind of the specter in the room, which is uh, generative AI. Um, and I have this under supporting accessible assessment design, and I'm sure some of you are just like, what? Like generative AI can support accessible assessment design? Hear me out. Um, a lot of these tools, uh, Microsoft tools that we're using right now <clears throat> are are being supported by you know generative AI, like the captions that we have here. Um, the uh, the automatic alt text that are created in PowerPoints, for example, right? This is an example of generative AI tools supporting making documents more accessible and then in turn supporting making assessment more accessible. Now I say this as a caveat, right? Um, those those tools are generative, right? So they have generated what they think they see on the screen. And so it's always important for us to go back and make sure that that is true. Right. So just because an alt text may be generated for an image doesn't necessarily mean that the alt text generated for that image is true or is true in the context of how you're using it. Right. And so this lovely uh, link that Matt has put in the chat actually talks a little bit about how to create um, good um, alt text for for images or things to think about. Um, but this is just one way that generative AI can help with these um, accessible assessment uh, strategies. Right. I know that. Um, there are some instances where people will use these tools to kind of help outline some on um, brainstorm some ideas and then they use that to actually write the thing that they need to write right and for people where coming up with that original idea is really difficult right so finding a, an original idea out of the ether um, is really hard that these are some uh, ways that this can help support um, like, OK, maybe this is something that I can explore and then I will go on and create my report or create my thing in a way that makes sense. Uh, in the last um, in the last slide uh, in the slide deck, uh, there's a whole bunch of resources there. Um, there's a there's a, a book um, by uh, Jue and uh, and and it all uh, from like last year from this year actually that talks about inclusive design um, and inclusive assessment design and I strongly recommend it. They have really great um, really great uh, chapters in there uh, about social justice. Really great chapters in there about using disability theory to do your assessment strategies. Really great chapters about uh, building an in indigenous pedagogy into your um, assessment strategies and so on. Um, in teaching, a common problem is in the assessment uh, is easiest alt tag to create is simply the answer to the question, but in some good thought goes into generating an alternative alt tag. I have a really good resource for that, uh, Matt, which I will share when uh, I'm done doing this thing. Um, I have a massive PDF to share with everyone if they're interested. Um, so yeah, so these are some ways that these are some ways that we can support accessible uh, design. Here are some barriers or threats, as I say, um, to accessible assessment design. Generative AI. <laughs> We're like, wait, what? What? Yeah, 
Right. So we live in both and world. Um, and so uh, welcome to both and world. Um, I, I put a link or a reference to uh, an article by Land. Land did some fantastic work about how a lot of these generative AI tools are ableist because they were trained on ableist data. Um, a lot of the actual tool itself is difficult for folk to navigate if they're using assistive technology. And so if you're interested in that, I strongly recommend that article by Land. Um, it It'll get you to think about some of the you know, barriers to using generative AI in your courses and your assessments and making sure that all of the learners in your class can actually use those. So generative AI can help in some ways, right? Um, but generative AI can also be a barrier if we're not thinking about the actual accessibility of the tool. Um, some other barriers to accessible assessment design are the kinds of barriers that we see with ableism, disableism, and so on, which are assumptions and attitudinal barriers. Um, you know, Dea Dolmage has a fantastic book called Academic Ableism that talks about how our whole sort of higher education system is built on ableism um, and those assumptions. Um, and so uh, it's uh, an opportunity for us in this space uh, because you've all you've all chosen to be here. And, and share space with us to think about how we can move beyond these ableist constructs uh, that are oftentimes seen in our attitudes in higher education. And the other thing is um, irrelevant constructs. Um, I also, shameless plug, put a a link to the George Brown College U UDL certificate, which I worked on. Julia also was part of that as well, um, because I told them, "Hey, you should talk to Julia." Um, and so there's a there's a part in that um, in that UDL certificate where they talk about reflecting on the relevant and irrelevant constructs in your course. So let me give you an example. Um, having uh, maybe you're teaching a course that has nothing to do with writing but the students have to write something um, and that you're putting you know 60 percent of the weight of your assessment on grammar and spelling and organizational skills right as opposed to the actual content of the assessment right so Oftentimes these irrelevant constructs kind of sneak into our learning outcomes, especially if you've um, inherited a course from someone. This is not something that you've designed yourself. Um, you know, if you're a sessional instructor and you've been given the, like the previous outline of the person who used to teach this, I think that um, thinking about what is really like sort of the key relevant essential goal, idea, outcome of your course is important because then it'll avoid creating learning outcomes that are inaccessible, creating learning outcomes that are um, that might be ableist even. Another barrier to accessible assessment design is uh, tech bans, right? Like you can't use you can't use computers in this class, right? Um, so this kind of goes back to the question that someone asked in the chat about like how do I uh, feel like somebody isn't excluded and so on. Um, I think that this is really important because with tech bans, if somebody ends up using a tech piece of technology and you said that no one else in the class can use technology, you've basically like outed that person, right? And so we want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that, you know, if you say that a certain type, like a computer or whatever can't be used, um, that we want to think about like all of the learners in the class. And then also, um, also word choice, right? Um, this is something that I'm working on. Um, so be on the lookout in the winter. Um, of uh, things, uh, the kinds of words that we use in our everyday speech and everyday use, and the kinds of words that we use in our instructions and our assignments. We have a lot of ableist language in higher education. We have a lot of things that we use on a regular basis that we don't actually think about like, hey, that's actually pretty ableist. And so, um, people will pick up on those word choices. And so in order to make your assessment more inclusive, think about the kinds of words that that we use, right? And, uh, and you know, modify them in ways that we can change them. I'm just looking in the chat. Um, how does integration of AI influence your application of curriculum in your institution? Um, and then there's this long thing from uh, Brock. Yes, and so that's the that's the guidance on um, Gen AI that somebody will post a link in the chat about as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, so finally, because I've been talking and I want to give you some space to talk, um, 
when you're designing your assessments and you're thinking about this, we've talked a little bit about generative AI. We know that everybody really cares about uh, generative AI. Oh, examples of ableist language. Okay. Um, warning, using words that may be ableist before I answer this question. Um, crazy instead of outrageous. Um, you know, this is a blind spot instead of like a gap. For example, um, I also have an excellent resource on that that I'm happy to share uh, in the chat uh, for you to to look at. But those are some examples of the kinds of words that we use and we just use them because we've always used them. Um, and um, yeah, but crazy is crazy is one of those that happens a lot. Um, oh, you're welcome. Thanks for asking that question. I'm just making a note to myself to remind myself what to put in the chat for you as a resource. Um, so when we're thinking about generative AI, we really want to think about these disability justice principles, um, which are um, uh, important in thinking about this. So we talked about inter intersectionality. We talked about interdependence. Um, we talked about like collective access in, in a lot of these things. Um, and solidarity, I think, as, as a disability justice principle is something that we tend to um, kind of think about, but we don't actually, you know, do. So if we want to build that community, we want to build uh, solidarity um, in, in those ways, then we want to really think about how that's, uh, how that's done um, in our courses as well. Um, if we're going to be using generative AI and we want to think about the user experience, we want to make sure that um, the user experience of that tool is inclusive, right? So can people use screen readers? Can people, you know, use their keyboard to tab through certain things, but also like this is a real opportunity to critique that input output, right? This is a real opportunity to say like, okay, well, what are these tools producing? Are they producing things that are ableist? Are they producing things that are biased? Are they producing things that are inequitable? If so, why? Is it because of the input? Is it because of the output? There's real opportunity there, regardless of what discipline you're in, to have a conversation about that and like really opening that space up to that critique uh, of input and output. And so that's it for me. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, time to think about if, I've sparked anything in terms of some stuff that uh, you may not have thought of, um, how maybe your idea of accessible assessment has changed, um, and if there's maybe something that I've shared that you may want to put in uh, your assessment strategies going forward. Um, you're, you know, I feel free to share in the chat if you feel like it. Um, and that's okay too if you don't, because I know that you know you're probably going to be processing things. Um, and if this becomes uh, an email to me later, um, that's fine too. Um, and so, fun fact: here's um, fun fact. That's not a fun fact. Um, here's here's my email address, <laughs> and also <laughs> the CVI head dev email. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing so that I can actually share some um, share some resources that I said that I was going to share and find them. But thank you for being in space and community with me, and I hope this was helpful in some way. Thanks so much, Anne. I love the fun fact of your, of your email. Fun fact, it's not a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just remind people that like that you shared so many great links that um, yeah. are included in the slides, and so we did share them, and I'll share them again. I think Rajiv wanted to say something, so I'll leave some space for him to pop on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Just uh, I'll, I'll be quick uh, in part, because I want to give Anne a moment to pop in some links, as well as people to maybe reflect as well. On the, on the fabulous presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't name, know me yet, I'm Rajiv Jangiani, a service Brock's Vice Provost Teaching and Learning, uh, which means I have the great privilege of, of supporting the wonderful team in CPI every day. Um, just a couple of quick things. One is I wanted to thank everybody for making time to attend our first webinar in this new series, which of course is designed to support our community of educators at Brock in areas of greatest need. So thrilled especially to kick the series off with uh, the newest member of our team, someone who we've long admired and are now fortunate to call a colleague. Uh, but I'll also flag that you know, it is not an accident uh, that our first webinar is focusing on accessible assignments and UDL. This is a very, very top priority for us in CPI and Brock, including in our academic plan. Uh, and for us, knowing that our learning environments, the ones that we design, the experiences that we deliver for students are as inclusive and supportive as possible. So we appreciate your presence here today, your ongoing engagement with CPI, and 
certainly looking forward to, to the questions and the discussion uh, that will follow now. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, everybody.